Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is September 23rd. Well, apologies for the show getting out a little bit late this morning. So I have two high school age children, and they're both fully vaccinated, but they're going to a school that does not require mask wearing. And so I think they've been back in school about a month, but of course, kids are starting to get sick. And PJ started complaining of a sore throat and a headache. And so, of course, that sets a ton of things in motion. But he did have a COVID test at the pediatrician's office yesterday. And just to show that he's not alone, they had run out of their quick tests, of their rapid tests. And so we just found out this morning that he doesn't have COVID, that he just has your garden variety fall virus. So there you go, not feeling too well, but at least it's not COVID. And that means I can go down into the basement and do laundry because that's where I had him sequestered. And so now that area is fair game. I can't hold off on doing laundry anymore. That excuse is gone. But then another item on the list for later on today that I've been putting off in my front garden is a row of five Autumn Magic chokeberry bushes that were installed, oh, I suppose, about three or four years ago now. And when they were first planted, I thought, yeah, these aren't so bad. I'll like these. But every year, I find myself less and less enamored with them. I think they would be fine in other parts of the landscape, but not in the front of the house. I'm looking for something that packs a little bigger punch, and these chokeberries are not doing it for me. So they got to go. Now, something that I do to kind of spur myself along, if I'm not taking action on something that needs to be done in the garden is I don't wait. I don't wait until I have all the pieces in place, the new shrubs bought, the new mulch, the new whatever, or a fully formed plan. If something needs to go and it's not getting addressed, for me, the best thing I've found to do is simply get it out of there because at least then I'll have a clean slate to work with. It's just too easy to let things go from one season into the next And before you know it, I'll be looking at these chokeberry bushes for another three years, and I don't want that. So those guys are going away this afternoon, and Max is going to be right there with me. He'll be on squirrel watch, but he's going to be my accountability partner and make sure that we get that done because he needs to spend a little bit of time outside this afternoon. So that's what we're going to do. That's the plan. Anyway, speaking of shrubs... Here's today's curated news. All right, today's curated news comes to us from Garden Gate. It was written by Susan Martin, a great garden writer. And the title of this post is Small Flowering Shrubs with big impact. This is exactly what I'm looking for. Let me tell you a few of these plants that are getting profiled in this piece. Susan provides lengthy descriptions. She'll tell you everything you need to know about them. And she also talks about why she's focusing on these smaller flowering shrubs for two reasons. First, We all don't have space for enormous shrubs. Sometimes we need a more petite and controlled shrub for a space that we're working in, like my front garden. And the other point that she makes is that when you're looking for a small flowering shrub, you need to make every inch count. So in small spaces, when you're working with plants, try to find things that have a dual purpose. You know, one time I thought blueberry bushes were going to be the perfect solution for this front north-facing garden. And so I put a few toward the front because the front area got more sun. Now, blueberry bushes are a great option for a small flowering shrub because they are small, But even more than that, they do serve a dual purpose. They're an edible and they can be an ornamental. And you get three season interest with blueberries. You get the beautiful spring, cute little blossoms. You get the pretty foliage. They look great in the fall and you get the berry. 
The only downfall for me is where I was putting these blueberries. Even though I really wanted them to work in the space that I had picked for them, they were just getting too beat up in the winter because they're right next to the driveway. So between the salt and the snow blowing, they just weren't having it and they just didn't thrive. So they're out, Potentilla are in. They just went in this summer and they can be a really nice flowering shrub as well. But here's what Susan suggests. Let's go through this list here. So she starts out with the Cape Cod Big Leaf Hydrangea, beautiful purpley blue blossoms on this hydrangea. What's not to like? Actually, that might be the option I end up going with. So they're definitely a wonderful small flowering shrub. Next on the list is the Autumn Coral Azalea. This is a beautiful azalea, and it looks like it has a little hint of peach in it, but it really is a pink azalea. I love the name Autumn Coral. Next on the list is Magical Gold Forsythia. Now, of course, Forsythia are going to give you that beautiful punch of gold in the spring, but I say be strategic with where you're going to put it. This is a shrub because it stands out so much in the early spring. You can put it in a back border and still enjoy it from the window. And the other thing to think about with this shrub is that that beautiful bloom is very ephemeral. It only hangs around for about two weeks. So when we're coming out of the gloom of winter, it's wonderful, but then you kind of forget about it for the rest of the year. Plus, these guys need pruning, or they're going to be all over the place in no time. Next on the list is Little Devil Nine Bark. Very, very cute. Love the pink blossom on these. And then she talks about the Orchid Annie Butterfly Bush. Right now, I don't grow any butterfly bushes because they are Zone 5, and I live in Zone 4. So those are out for me but they are beautiful, is very, very pretty. And of course, it's gonna do the job of attracting pollinators like crazy. Next, Susan talks about the boomerang, or excuse me, the bloomerang, dwarf pink lilac. Now, the reason this one has that bloomerang title is that it's a repeat bloomer. It's going to produce another flush of color. Now, it's not going to be as vigorous as that first burst of color, but you're still going to get more blooms than you would off of those original lilacs. So this is a good option to consider. Now, Little Lime Panicle Hydrangea made the list. This is one of my personal favorites. I love this particular hydrangea, and it's definitely much more compact than some hydrangeas that you can buy. And if you're not careful buying hydrangea, you can end up with quite an enormous specimen. So you definitely want to pay attention. This is going to be one of the more compact hydrangeas, Little Lime Panicle Hydrangea. I see this list has a beautiful camellia and a petite knockout rose. Oh, and also here, blueberry. This is the Peach Sorbet Northern Highbush Blueberry. Very, very cute. And then she wraps things up here with Brouhaha Crepe Myrtle, which can be grown in zones six through nine. But if you live in an area where the temperatures drop, especially down around that zero mark, this crepe myrtle will probably die back to the ground, but then it'll come back in the spring. All right, that's it for small flowering shrubs with big impact from Susan Martin over at Garden Gate. Now, if you would like to read this article in detail for yourself, just head on over to the Facebook group for the show. You can find this article by going up to the little magnifying glass at the top. Just search for the word shrub and Susan's post will pop right up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group for the show, don't worry about it. You can join at any time. The next time you're on Facebook, if you can remember, just head on up to the search bar where you'd look for an old friend and type in the words Daily Gardener Community and then answer a few questions and I'll welcome you into the group. It's just that simple. I look forward to meeting you and seeing a few pictures of your garden, if you'd like to share them with us. So we'll see you in there. All right, it's time for today's botanical history. Music 
Here's Botanical History for today, September 23rd. Today is the birthday of Horace Walpole, the fourth Earl of Orford, an English writer, an art historian, and a Whig politician. He was born on this day in 1717. His father served as the first British Prime Minister. Now, when he became an adult, Horace designed a picturesque summer home for himself. It's located in southwest London, and he called it Strawberry Hill. Horace's little castle caused a sensation, and he opened his home to a maximum of four lucky visitors each day. Online, I ran across an 1842 admission ticket to Strawberry Hill, and it spelled out the rules for tourists. It said, the house and garden are never shown in an evening, and persons are desired not to bring children with them. So, no kids allowed. Now, the Gothic Revival architecture, complete with a round tower at Strawberry Hill, was Horace's way of paying homage to his accomplished ancestry. And this castle is as beautiful inside as it is outside. The stained glass and the library are two of the most favorite aspects of Strawberry Hill among visitors. And despite his silver spoon upbringing, Horace was a hardworking writer and a serious scholar. Incidentally, he coined the word serendipity after he finally located a painting that he'd wanted for his home. Ten years later, he wrote the very first Gothic novel. It was called The Castle of Otranto, and it came out in 1764. In addition to his other works, Horace wrote The History of Modern Taste in Gardening in 1771. He was a fan of natural gardens, and he famously observed that his garden hero, William Kent, was the first garden designer to, quote, leap the fence and see that all of nature was a garden. Now, as for Horace, he greatly enjoyed his five-acre romantic garden at Strawberry Hill, which he affectionately called his enchanted little landscape and his land of beauties. In addition to a grove of lime trees, the garden featured a large Rococo shell seat with a back that was designed to look like an enormous shell. Today, that one-of-a-kind bench has been recreated and installed back in the garden, and now copies are available for gardeners who want to purchase one for their own gardens. And the oldest tree on the grounds of Strawberry Hill is called the Walpole Oak. It is said that a servant hung himself from the tree after stealing silver. In 2019, the very first Strawberry Hill House Flower Festival was held, and it offered local florists a chance to share their beautiful creations inside Horace's Gothic masterpiece. The event is now an annual celebration of flowers. This year's event is coming up in October. Today, Strawberry Hill House hosts a community garden. Now, if you're a rose lover, you can enjoy your own nod to Horace Walpole with a bubblegum pink David Austin rose named Strawberry Hill. Horace was a prolific writer, a man who loved beauty, and he was a man of great industry. Yet, when it was time to recharge, he often found inspiration in gardens. He once wrote, One's garden is to be nothing but riant or cheerful and the gaiety of nature. So the garden was all good in Horace's book. He was also a fan of greenhouses and in particular the control that they afforded gardeners. In a letter to William Mason on July 6th in 1777, he wrote, Don't let this horrid weather put you out of humor with your garden. 
though I own it's a pity that we should have brought it to perfection and then have too bad a climate to enjoy it. It is strictly true this year, as I have often said, that ours is the most beautiful country in the world when it is framed and glazed. Those wonderful greenhouses. Finally, it was Horace Walpole who wrote, When people will not weed their own minds, they are apt to be overrun by nettles. And today is the birthday of Mary Elizabeth Coleridge. Her pen name was Anadas. She was an English writer, polyglot, and poet. And she was born on September 23rd in 1861. And here's a fun fact. Mary was the great-grandniece of the English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And I thought you'd enjoy this little excerpt from Mary's poem called September. She wrote, Now every day the bracken browner grows, even the purple stars of clematis that shone about the bars grow browner, and the little autumn rose dons for her rosy gown sad weeds of brown. Now falls the eve, and ere the morning sun, many a flower her sweet life will have lost, slain by the bitter frost who slays the butterflies also, one by one, the tiny beasts that go about their business and their feasts. Now, Mary also wrote one more poem that I wanted to share with you today. This is an utterly charming little garden poem that she called Gibberish. It goes like this. Many a flower have I seen blossom, many a bird for me will sing. Never heard I so sweet a singer, never saw I so fair a thing. She is a bird a bird that blossoms. She is a flower, a flower that sings. And I a flower when I behold her. And when I hear her, I have wings. And it was on this day, September 23rd, in 1958, that the Dayton Daily News out of Ohio shared a little article about an old park that had been created to teach botany students. Here's an excerpt. Back in 1930, brother William Beck, a member of the University of Dayton biology department, filled two purposes with one park. The campus green needed re-landscaping and botany classes needed nearby well-stocked gardens to study. So William set to work on his project with the aid of local nurseries and collected over 200 varieties of plants and shrubs in the Central Campus Park, labeling all of them with their Latin names and English derivatives. And since that time, the University of Dayton tended such out-of-the-ordinary plants as a Logan elm, which was a transplanted sprout from the famous tree, a coffee tree, pyramidal oaks, black elders, and ginkgo trees, to name a few. But sadly, Brother Beck's well-worked-out plan seems to have been practically forgotten through the years. Botany classes no longer wind among the shrubbery. And it was on this day, September 23rd, in 1986, that Congress selected the rose as the American national flower. The Journal News out of White Plains, New York, reported that the House, brushing aside the claims of marigolds and dogwood blossoms, corn tassels and columbines ended decades of indecision Tuesday and crowned the rose, that thorny beauty, America's national flower. The voice vote decision ended a debate over an appropriate national floral emblem for the United States, 
that had flickered off and on since the late 19th century. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from Alice Hoffman from her best-selling fiction book, The Marriage of Opposites. Even now, as the graves of these women went untended and their passings unmourned, the seeds they had scattered turned the hillsides red and orange from May to September. Some called the pirate's bounty flame trees, but to us they were known as flamboyant trees, for no one could ignore their glorious blooms with flowers that were larger than a man's open hand. Every time I saw them, I thought of these lost women. That was what happened if you waited for love. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Will Bonzel's Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening by Will Bonzel. This book came out in 2015, and the subtitle is Innovative Techniques for Growing Vegetables, Grains, and Perennial Food Crops with Minimal Fossil Fuel and Animal Inputs. In this book, Maine farmer and homesteader Will Bonzel shares his expertise in self-reliance. In this aspect of living, along with energy, Will is a master. As Will likes to say, my goal is not to feed the world, but to feed myself and let others feed themselves. Now, when it comes to the garden, Will is open to experimentation. He's always trying new techniques and practices, and he shares his hard-fought wisdom in a friendly and conversational way. Will's an inventive pragmatist, and his flexibility and innovative thinking have allowed him to tackle seemingly insurmountable challenges for growing in his down-to-earth way. If you're ready to become more self-reliant, Will's book is a reference you will want to have on your shelf. This book is 400 pages of Back to the Land and Garden Prosperity with Will Bonzel as your personal guide. You can get a copy of Will Bonzel's Essential Guide to Radical Self-Reliant Gardening by Will Bonzel and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $25. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today we wish a happy heavenly birthday to Edgar Lee Masters, who was born on this day, September 23rd in 1869. He was an American attorney, poet, and writer, and his most famous work was his collection of poems that narrated the epitaphs of people from a fictional town named Spoon River, and it was all put together in a book called The Spoon River Anthology, which was originally published in 1915. Now, Edgar grew up in Lewiston, Illinois, which is near an actual Spoon River. That was his inspiration. And I thought I would pluck one of his epitaphs out to read to you today. And so I picked out his epitaph for a fictional nurseryman, a man who was a lover of trees and flowers, who was named Samuel Gardner. And the epitaph that Edgar Lee Masters wrote for him ends with these words. Now I, an undertenant of the earth, can see that the branches of a tree spread no wider than its roots. 
And how shall the soul of a man be larger than the life he has lived? Edgar also once wrote a poem about love, and it began this way. Love is a madness. Love is a fevered dream. A white soul lost in a field of scarlet flowers. And finally, Edward's poem, Botanical Garden, is a conversation with God, and it ends with God saying these words, If it be comforting, I promise you, another spring shall come. And then God is asked, and after that? And he answers, another spring. That's all I know myself. There shall be springs and springs. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.